So the topic today that I chose uh, is reversibility of pulpitis. And the reason I chose it because I think it's extremely important for uh, residents and also for uh, endodontists to really understand the subjects because pulpitis is our game. And what, what we're going to talk about today is the history of uh, the diagnostic terms that we used. We will also talk about um, uh, our diagnostic tools and how accurate they are to reveal the uh, status of the pulp. Uh, and then we'll talk about a couple of uh, papers in uh, vital pulp therapy. Now, you must be all aware of our diagnostic terms, the AAE 2009 consensus. We have the uh, pulpal diagnosis and we also have the apical diagnosis. But how did we come up with these terms? It's important to know the history of these terms to be able to appreciate the amount of work that the researchers have done over the past years. And this could lead us to see in the future if these terms are going to be changed or not. To begin with, I'd like to start uh, from 1954. Rebel have uh, done a diagnostic terms, actually classification, but that was done on histology. So what they did, they extracted teeth and then they did histology and they did this, these terms. But the problem is these are histological terms. And these are useless in the clinic when we do root canal treatments because we cannot really do uh, histology and teeth. And we have two categories, the acute papitis, chronic papitis, uh, and so many different names. This is useless and nobody uh, have used it in the past. In 1970, Bohm came up with uh, the classification that used symptoms. And for the first time, they have included symptoms to be with the histological terms. And we have the uh, two classification that has uh, symptoms, class one and two, pulps without symptoms, and then pulp with history of pain. Some researchers actually have commented on this and they didn't like it because what they said that these are clinical and histopathological uh, or mixing clinical and histopathological nomenclature has been interwined, resulting in a mishmash of misleading terms and diagnosis. Because the problem, they couldn't find correlation, and we'll talk about that later. But this is why Seltzer uh, in 1973 did not like this idea. In 1977, Morse came up, or, or the first time, uh, talked about reversible and irreversible pulpitis. Again, uh, using these terms have been problematic to some researchers. You can see the Taliq um, Seltzer and Bender. He called it classification for therapeutic purposes and also said that the diagnosis implies prediction based on clinical judgment of the type of uh, pulp treatment indicated and its probable outcome. We will talk about that later, okay? But let's move on. And then we came up with the 2009. Uh, the, uh, we used the symptomatic and asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis. And to dig more of that 2009 paper by Levin, I want you to, I want to share with you two paragraphs in the same paper, they talked about these um, uh, diagnostic terms. On the left, typically these classification mix clinical and histologic terms, resulting in many misleading terms and diagnosis for the same clinical condition. This creates confusion and uncertainty in clinical practice when a rational treatment uh, plan need to be established. 
another paragraph in the same paper they said or or she said currently differentiating between reversible and irreversible pulpitis is largely done on an empirical basis it is also not known whether the pulp are ever truly irreversibly uh, inflamed that is could all pulps inflam inflammation uh, recover if conservative treatment strategies were used this question requires further research to establish an answer i'm sorry about this uh, wordy uh, slide but i think it's important to understand that yes we came up with diagnostic terms but we still have issues okay so to to summarize this section of the of the presentation um our current diagnostic terms um, are more clinical but there is no total agreement on the current classification sorry now i want you to imagine that you have a line and there is pulp necrosis and healthy pulp on one side and i want you to think about the status of reversible and irreversible and ask yourself is there a tipping point where can tell we where we can tell that the pulp has gone from irrever to from reversible to irreversible pulpitis and if so how can we identify it based on whether there is symptoms or clinical information and to answer this questions we need to talk, to ask ourselves another question how accurately can any patient symptoms together with other clinical information reveal the condition of the pulp now what i'm going to talk about is our diagnostic tools or any other information can they help us to see whether the pulp is truly irreversible or not and to begin with i'd like to share this quick slides to explain the difference between sensitivity and specificity and you might all know that sensitivity is how accurate a test can diagnose or identify disease specificity how accurate a diagnostic tool can actually identify healthy uh, cases we'll talk about sensitivity and specificity i just wanted to clear that out now the first part is symptoms as indicators this is a study that was done by damar and it was to try to correlate if there is any correlation between the status of the pulp and our diagnostic tools they did 47 teeth they did thermal electrical percussion and the reference test in this study was histology so they collect the data they look at histology and they see how uh, accurate they correlate to each other and the, res the result uh, there is no association between the test uh, uh, and the infl inflammatory status of the pulp uh, all intact pulp teeth exhibited hypersensitivity to either cold or heat which is interesting and one more point that is extremely important the absence of pain did not rule out extensive inflammatory changes so you might have inflammation but you don't have any symptoms or any uh, uh, response to cold so what we can tell from this study is that pain failed to determine the extent of inflammation another very important classical study by Seltzer in 1963 and they wanted to see the correlation between diagnostic data and actual histological findings they did 166 teeth they extracted and the reference uh, also was uh, histology and they'd like to share with you uh, two tables on the left you have treatable and non treatable treatable basically is reversible uh, non treatable is irreversible and you can tell in the irreversible cases um incidence of pain is 
and chronic total pulpitis is 64. Total pulp necrosis is 54. So we're missing a lot of data. We don't know why these cases are not complaining of any pain. On the other hand, intact, uninflamed teeth, 13% exhibited an incidence of pain. So that is even more confusing. The same with the EBT uh, for, for both cases, the normal cold, the normal heat. You can see that data are not really, we don't have a good specificity and sensitivity. So from this uh, paper, we can conclude that pain percussion thermal tests had poor correlation with uh, histology. Another paper uh, looked at, they wanted to see uh, preoperative clinical markers and the test, uh, the reference test is the outcome. So basically they do collect data, they follow up the cases and see how successful uh, the cases are. And what they found from this study that success rate was significantly less for teeth with profused um, bleeding. And this is where we came up with if you see non stop bleeding, then you should do a root canal treatment. But the other uh, um, uh, parameters, pain, age, thermal stimulus, and percussion, were not associated with poorer outcome, which is interesting. One more interesting paper, I just want to confuse you even more. Um, this is interesting uh, uh, study by Michelson and Holland from Michigan University. They looked at the hist it's a ret retrospective study that looked at 2,200 cases. And what they found is that approximately 40% of teeth had no history of any pain. So they go to necrosis without any pain, which is, which, which is similar to Seltzer finding. Uh, it's around 40%. Now, the last study I wanted to add in this section is Rikuchi in 2014 correlation between clinical and histological pulp diagnosis. And they did around 95 teeth, and they found there is a high correlation between uh, uh, reversible and uh, reversible pulpitis with normal uh, or no symptoms and irreversible pulpitis. But when they talked about irreversible pulpitis in this paper, what they mean is that there is bacteria inside the pulp. Okay, that's a very important point. So you can, you can read in the yellow that infection advancing to the pulp tissue, infection is bacteria, was common finding in teeth with irreversible pulpitis, but was never observed in normal reversibly inflamed pulps. And let me just show you um, one case from their paper. Now you can see there is bacteria, and the bacteria is next to the site of infection, right? But I, I want you to focus on the rest of the pulp. The rest of the pulp is completely fine. There is no inflammatory cells, and there is no necrosis. So, so it's always uh, towards the site of the infection, and the rest of the pulp is normal, okay? Now, before I go, this paper, the problem with this paper is that they didn't explain why so many pulps, they go to necrosis without any symptoms. That's number one. So we cannot really rely on this study unless it's repeated in different places. The second part is biological markers as indicators. In this paper, they wanted to see if they can collect blood samples from the pulp and they can see or correlate between uh, the level of white blood cells to the degree of inflammation. And there is a poor, poor correlation. Unfortunately, uh, sensitivity was 36% and specificity was 64%. The other part um, 
is now whatever we talked about, we tried to correlate and we couldn't. Now I'm going to talk about sensitivity tests, uh, which are divided into the hot and cold, and the, the tests that are used to determine whether there is a blood flow or not. With the sensitivity tests, unfortunately, the only information you can get from these are actually whether the pulp is vital or not. And they're not that high. So we're not absolutely 100% at determining whether the pulp is vital or not, let alone trying to establish or trying to get information about the degree of inflammation. Um, this is an old study by Seltzer, and they wanted to see whether uh, two, whether the uh, hot and cold separately or combined uh, can give a high specificity or uh, sensitivity. And they found that um, the combination actually give you higher specificity uh, while sensitivity is decreased. But I like this paper more by Wilder uh, because they used the electrical and the cold test separately or in combination. They found that if you use them together, combined, uh, the sensitivity is around 96%, uh, specificity around 92%. But if you use each one alone, it might give you 85, 86% uh, specificity and sensitivity. And the reference in this study was direct uh, visual inspections. So basically they do the test, collect the information, and then they access the pulp and they would see whether it's vital or not. That's it. Now let's move on to determine whether there is blood flow or not. Uh, laser Doppler flowmetry was used in this paper by Evans. And they found that the result was 100% sensitivity and specificity. The problem with laser Doppler flowmetry is that it's not really available commercially. And if they are available commercially, you can actually get false positive, especially if you angle the beam towards the gum. So you really need the pulp to be much higher away from the gum to be able to use it. If it's a little bit lower and you direct it to the gum, it actually can give you false positive readings. The last paper I wanted to mention is that uh, this, they used actually a pulse oximetry and they found that uh, it gave 100% sensitivity and 95% specificity. Again, it's not commercially available. These, these two tests can only tell you whether the pulp is vital or not. That's it cannot tell you anything about the degree of inflammation. Now, to go back to our questions, how accurate the patient's symptoms together with, with the clinical information reveal the condition of the pulp? Not really accurate, and that is the reality. To summarize this uh, section of the presentation, scientifically, pain is insufficient to provide a valid information regarding the extent of the inflammation. Sensitivity tests can only differentiate between vital and non-vital teeth with no information about the extent of inflammation. With our limited clinical tools, we cannot really truly diagnose vital pulps. And for research directions, uh, difficulty in establishing a relevant, a relevant reference standard, it's not really uh, uh, practical to do histology it's not practical to do visual inspection. Uh, so we need something creative, something different like biological markers, things like that, that we cannot, we don't need a lab. Uh, we can just do it at the time of the treatment and it can tell you whether there is uh, extensive inflammation or not. We also need to know how clinical symptoms and tests are interlinked and together influence the accuracy of diagnosis. Uh, we need outcome studies of vital pulp therapies in relation 
to previous clinical information. I'm going, the last point, I'm going to explain it a little bit more later. Now, I just wanted to really go over the caries exposure controversy because in the past, um, we really did not trust uh, any caries exposure. And I'm going to share with you a couple of quotes by Rebel. The exposed pulp is doomed organ. Seltzer, caries exposure automatically places the pulp of the tooth in the untreatable category. Untreatable mean, it means irreversible. Sigurdsson, the pulp should always be considered irreversibly inflamed if it has caries exposure. Holland, exposure by soft caries is irreversible pulpitis. I think these are big statements that have been uh, revised. And I think what, what's going on here is that because there is, there used to be a belief that there is a strangulation of the pulp. They call it strangulation theory. What that means is that when there is an inflammation, there will be increased in the pulp um, blood pressure, which is going to cause the pulp to strangle itself epically and die. We're going to see if that is true. Van Hassel did a paper, which is a physiological study. This is not histological study, physiological. And what they, he found that the pulpal blood pressure is actually localized to the site of infection. Again, pulpal blood pressure is localized to the site of infection, which means that the pulp, when it dies, it, it dies in increments, okay? And that has been proven in many histological studies. If you see any slide of uh, deep caries, you're going to see that the site of infection um, is, has a lot of inflammatory cells. The rest of the pulp is fine. And that is not new. I mean, Mitchell have found that only rarely did the inflammation extend into the root canals. Seltzer uh, also commented the pulp tissue in the radicular portion of the pulp is usually normal. Zerlotti, even when the entire pulp uh, coronal pulp tissue was inflamed, the radicular tissue were unaffected. And let me share with you a slide by uh, Ricucci. You can see that there is a microabscess and then inflammatory cells, and then the rest of the pulp is normal. There is no inflammatory cells. So I want you to think about this case. If you do full pulpotomy, do you think it's going to work if you work in an aseptic environment? We'll talk about that later then. Now, the terms reversible or irreversible pulpitis is divided into two to be able to understand it. Reversible is a term based on prediction of the outcome of the treatment. So it's not a histological term. Pulpitis is actually a histological diagnostic term, which means inflammation of the pulp. Reversible and irreversible are actually based on the history of treatments of pulp cap. Because in the past, when we treat teeth that are symptomatic with pulp cap, they fail. That's why we call them irreversible pulpitis, because if we do conservative treatment with them, they fail. That was 20 years ago. Now, what if we improve our therapeutic techniques? What if we have bioceramic and MTA? What if we work in aseptic environment? This should be revised. And to confirm that, this is what Seltzer had said. The diagnosis implies prediction based on the clinical judgment of the type of pulp treatment indicated and its probable outcome probable outcome. Now, last year in Vienna, for the first time, official institute have changed the uh, terms. 
reversible and irreversible. And this was in the European Society of Endodontology Position Statement, Management of Deep Caries and Exposed Pulp. And I'm going to share with you uh, two lines here. First line, reversible and irreversible papitis remain useful, okay, but require revision to reflect the initial nature or irreversible damage, which is partial and confined to the coronal pulp. Again, alternatively, full pulpotomy, this is uh, what they talk about is that how to manage uh, caries pulps. Alternatively, when you have irreversible pulpitis, alternatively, full pulpotomy may be successful using aseptic technique in cases where there is a partial irreversible pulpitis in the coronal part. However, better long-term prospective randomized data is required, which is true. We still need data, but I don't want you to lock your brain to a, to a certain uh, mentality that you will never change it in the next 20 years. I want you to be open to assess the case and see if, if, if you can work it or not. Now, typically when you have asymptomatic tooth that has deep caries, you can actually do indirect pulp cap, which is basically partial caries removal, which is basically you just remove the caries uh, peripherally and leave the caries close to the pulp to maintain a good two millimeter of remaining dentine thickness to reduce the chance of exposure. You can only do that when you have asymptomatic tooth. But if you have a symptomatic tooth, then you have to think about other things. Uh, I didn't have time to add actually partial caries removal, but I wanted to talk about uh, direct pulp cap, partial pulpotomy, and then full pulpotomy. And then I'll give you uh, a summary. Now, when it comes to direct pulp cap, as you know, you have exposure, you place MTA, and then you follow up. This is a case that was done, I'm not sure, uh, I think it's uh, in Saudi. They did 30 cases, young age group from 9 to 12. These are reversible pulpitis. Hemostatid with saline, MTA, IRM, and then they followed up for uh, around two years. And the success rate was around 94%. These are caries exposure. This is a paper or a case series that I really like that was done by Bogan. And what I like about it is that the age group is up to 40 years old. 45 years old, and he followed his cases for nine years. He did that in his clinic in California. And the clinical procedure is that he removed all caries, he mustated with sodium hydrochloride, he placed a thick MTA over the exposure and all the floor. It's important to seal the whole floor, okay? Do you know why? Because sometimes when we manage exposure, we focus on the exposure itself. And we, for, we forgot uh, or we forget uh, the thin dentines in other parts of the floor, which can actually be challenging for the pulp. So it's really recommended to seal the whole floor with at least two millimeter of MTA. So he placed temporary restoration using composite and then final restoration after five to 10 days. The importance of placing um, the final restoration in the second visit is because MTA needs uh, moisture to set. So you need to place a moisture or, or moist cotton on top of the MTA and then bring the patient after a couple of days to replace it with final uh, restorations. And the success was really high. It was surprising that he had a 96% and only one case had symptoms after five years. I think his success was because he used a thick MTA in the whole floor. Now, this paper was done um, in 2010, MTA, 75 teeth. And the problem with this uh, technique is that when they see the pulp exposure, they don't remove any caries. That's problem number one. And then, Problem number two is that they placed a thin layer of MTA. Look at this case. 
the pulp is very close to the uh, wall. So they don't have good amount of uh, dentine to actually seal that pulp. And the third problem with this is that they actually place the final restoration immediately. They use resin modified glass enamel over MTA and the final restoration. So success was 68%, which is low. Uh, and then in two years, 56%, I think because of leakage uh, rather than because of um, uh, the MTA itself. Now, I'm going to talk about partial pulpotomy. And this was a, a study that was done in, um, I think, Kuwait. Uh, age group uh, was young, 28 uh, permanent molars. And then they, they, uh, they followed up the, the cases, and they never had any teeth with the symptoms. Um, and 0% radiographic pathology, and 0% that needed extraction or, or, or root, root filling. And this is how it's done. You need to go inside the pulp by at least two millimeter to remove the suspected area and then have a good uh, cleaning before placing the MTA. And another paper, the same group in Kuwait University, they did 64 teeth, young age group. Uh, and the reason they the young age group because these are actually pediatric dentists, they're not in the dentist. Um, and these are asymptomatic, they did the pulpotomy or calcium hydroxide, they wanted to see which one is more successful. And the success was almost similar, 91, 93%, two failures in each group. The last part is full pulpotomy. Be before I talk about uh, full pulpotomy, I wanted to mention that pulpotomy if used as an emergency procedure for symptomatic pulpitis, it can give you relief, pain relief within 24 hours. Okay, and these are studies that have showed that. Why am I mentioning this right now? Because when you have a symptomatic pulpitis and you do a full pulpotomy, you would expect the patient to have a pain relief within 24 hours. And that was done by many studies, we'll talk about them later. But these studies on the screen, they are actually emergency studies. What they talked about is that you can do full pulpotomy if you wanted to do root canal treatment, bring the patient in another visit and then continue root canal treatment. But I wanted to use this piece of information for actually doing it for um, uh, symptomatic teeth. So this is by Milegi, and they did uh, 15 cases, calcium hydroxide or MTA, and then only two cases failed in the calcium hydroxide uh, uh, group. And what they did is a nice thick MTA. This is the key. Another paper, this is interesting because it was done in 1995, uh, Chalishkan from Turkey. What he did is 26 permanent molars uh, and carriage exposure, and the teeth actually had periabical radiolucency, which was interesting. And they just did calcium hydroxide, MTA was not available at that time. And he followed up these cases. He had 24 cases out of 26 had dentine bridge and periabical healing. Two of them required actually uh, pulpotomy. And you can see on the image on the left, there is a, the periabical lesion. And then on the right, uh, it's healing. The last one of this group is Witherspoon. Again, interesting study. He did uh, 23 um, pulpotomy on MTA on uh, Six, up to the age was up to 16 years old. And all the cases were diagnosed with irreversible pulpitis. I know it's crazy at that time. I think he did it in 2002. And he only, he had one case that has persistent disease, three cases in the healing uh, category and 15 actually have healed. These are young kids with irreversible pulpitis and he had successful uh, treatment. 
I'm going to mention two histological uh, studies real quick. This was uh, published in the Australian uh, Endodontic Journal. He had 14 molars. The age group was 16 to 24. And all the cases had a reverse propitis. They did full propotomy, thick MTA, hemostatus with saline. They did amalgam restoration, and they extracted the teeth after two months for orthodontic treatment. Results, all patients had pain relief in 24 hours. This is what we expected because we know that from the emergency studies, right? No pain or percussion after uh, two months. Histologically, dentine bridge in all cases and no inflammation or necrosis. Look at these slides. Uh, the CDB means complete dentine bridge. Um, and the image, the down MTA and then complete dentine bridge and then pulp. You can see that there is no inflammatory source. Another uh, histological paper, uh, they did that on uh, irreversible propitis, premolar. Uh, the patient was 19 years old, uh, placed MTA, thick MTA, and they followed up the case three months and 10 months. And they showed uh, what's interesting in 10 months, the, the tooth was actually positive to EBT. This is something that I found, um, is that many of my cases that I did um, full pulpotomy, they don't respond to cold, but they actually respond to EBT. I think the EBT reaches even uh, deeper uh, um, uh, pull compared to the cold test. All right, now to summarize this part, MTA is the best choice for vital pulp therapy. Vital for, uh, to the steps to do it, actually to use a rubber dam, this is a must. Hemostatus with either sodium hypochlorite uh, or saline. Seal the whole floor, this is important of dentine with bulk MTA at least two millimeter, allow MTA to set and restore permanently in a subsequent uh, appointment, seal the cavity the best you could to minimize marginal leakage. Now, there are uh, some new products that can actually sit uh, quicker than MTA or bioceramic. If you can get them, you may not need the second visit. This is just to um, let you know. Now, when I talk about this, you present this information to many old dentists. And the problem is that, okay, it's convincing, it's together, but they don't know how to deal with it. And some in the dentist, they might say, you know what, I don't see vital teeth, so I wouldn't care about this. Um, this is the, just a paper that I found. Um, this is from Penn, and they wanted to see how much of, of their cases are actually vital teeth. And you can tell that these are the residents. So this is 7,300 cases. And around 50%, 50% are actually vital teeth. So out of these, the symptomatic reverse propitis actually Thirty-seven uh, percent. So you can you can possibly depend depends on the um, setup that you work on. You might actually see a lot of symptomatic teeth, and you might need to consider these cases. Uh, we'll talk about what kind of cases later uh, to consider this uh, presentation. This is a questionnaire that was done to six hundred Danish uh, uh, general practitioners. Um, what they found is that they see around. 56% um, of their teeth are actually, are actually vital. So um, if this works or if this is going to work in the future, you can actually save a lot of pulps. Now, this is, I might have finished earlier, around 45 minutes, okay. Um, the summary of this presentation, and then we'll take uh, questions. Our diagnostic terms of pulpitis, should be symptomatic and asymptomatic. This is my opinion, okay? I don't have 
uh, specific papers, but this is what I collected. Asymptomatic uh, pulpitis, you can either do stepwise, partial caries removal, direct pulp cap, or partial pulpotomy. Uh, personally, I think partial caries removal is the best way to handle these cases if you have asymptomatic pulpitis. But if you have a problem with leaving caries behind, you have personal problem with caries, you can choose either direct pulp cap or partial pulpotomy. When it comes to symptomatic pulpitis, you can actually do full pulpotomy, okay? Now, maybe you wouldn't do it to everyone, but I want you to believe that this procedure actually works. So you can assist the situation. When you have a kid that is uncooperative, seven years old or eight years old, and you know that you really cannot do root canal treatment, you should consider doing full pulpotomy. If you have a handicapped patient, if you have apprehensive patients that you know that it's impossible to do root canal treatments, you wanted a very quick procedure, uh, you wanted to finish within 10, 15 minutes, then this is a good procedure to present to your patient. And with that, I would like, uh, before I thank you, <laughs> Let me just give you some uh, research directions. I think there is a substantial gaps in our knowledge base with respect to uh, treatment of vital pulp. Investigations to test the most effective treatment for a tooth with deep caries and focus on indirect pulp cap, stepwise excavation, direct pulp capping, partial pulpotomy, or full pulpotomy. All right, so I think it's time for questions, and I'm so sorry if that took time, but I'm almost uh, 47 minutes. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, Shabab, Samini, we'll learn them too. Yeah, I'm موجودين موجودين. الله يعطيك العافية. الله يعافيك. Uh, صراحة, it, was, it was amazing. Senator Mohammed Hwait, uh, he can unmute his mic. I thought all the questions would come from you. No, 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 because I remembered the word pain more than once. No, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, you have a lot of questions. A lot of questions, a lot of uh, hands. Uh, raised. Because we're listening to the vocal questions. Uh, sometimes it's easy. Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Samhan, for the uh, uh, informative uh, lecture. Uh, we really enjoyed it, and I'm pretty sure uh, uh, all the attendees uh, were uh, really having fun and uh, enjoyed it as well. Uh, we would like to have uh, some of the attendees who uh, raised hands to uh, to ask a vocal or a voice question, if you allow us, Dr. Samhan. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Okay, I'm just uh, going to go by uh, any, whatever I see, whatever I see. Uh, yeah, so, Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Hello, Doctor. How are you? Hello, how are you? Doctor, in the past uh, few days, we have talked about regenerative uh, endodontics. So how can we implant the regenerative endodontics by using the endodiagnosis that we have already? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if we have like a diagnosis of reversible pulpitis, uh, how can we use the treatment of, of, of the option of regenerative endo with the diagnosis that we have already. Okay, so my question to you is, are you talking about necrotic teeth or vital, uh, or vital teeth? Uh, what I understood in, in, the, in the last lecture that it's, uh, it's, it's more successful in vital teeth. So I think in vital teeth. Um, the problem is that I wasn't there to see really what's, what, what happened. But my understanding is that most of revascularization, revask cases 
are actually done in infected teeth and necrotic teeth. Um, I don't know actually uh, if if there is other regenerative uh, procedures that can be done on vital teeth. But um, who who was it? Was it uh, Muhammad Jamal? Doctor yes. Abad, and kit mojud muhadara. Can you step in if you are there? Sure, sure. Yeah, can the regenerative can Dr. Muhammad Jamal? Hey. Was it about the necrotic teeth or vital teeth? Yeah, yeah. لا 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 necrotic necrotic teeth. Okay, Muhammad. Yeah, then we go to abexogenesis if we talk about vital. Yeah, sure. Okay, Muhammad. Uh, was that clear or? Yeah, and uh, okay. the other thing is, uh, could our diagnosis be modified by the oral health status? I mean, for example, if, uh, if the patient have, like, for example, deep caries that are uh, asymptomatic and reaching to the pulp on the radiograph, but at the same time. His oral health status is poor. Can we like step, uh, skip a step and uh, do? Okay, so so basically, what you're saying, you cannot diagnosis is diagnosis, and diagnosis is a descriptive uh, sentence to a specific disease. You could have one diagnosis. You can only have one diagnosis. But you have multiple treatment plans, and then your treatment plan can be changed based on the situation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Allah yafik. Okay. So next, Fatum, uh, uh, you're allowed to talk. You can have. We can have your question right now. We can take uh, other questions if you want. Lahadma, you ready next. Okay, uh, so I have here uh, Fatima. Fatima Zaid. What's the difference between full pulpotomy and pulpectomy? Full pulpotomy, you remove the pulp chamber to the CAJ, and pulpectomy is basically remove the whole pulp. Okay, uh, that was uh, basic. Uh, it's, is the procedure of full pulpotomy same as pulpectomy? I think the same question. Again, what about asymptomatic reversible pulpitis with epical lesion? Selma is asking. When you have, when you have, um, it's, it, it could happen, but it's unlikely to have a lesion with vital pulp. Usually, lesions with vital pulp is very small and it cannot be detected with uh, 2D images. But if that happens, then the problem, the real problem, and this is a good question, is that we, could, we cannot really uh, diagnose asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis truly. That is our main dilemma, and this is what I, what I mentioned in the, at the beginning of the presentations, that 40% of our teeth could go to crosses without any symptoms. But when you do full pulpotomy, then you would be able to see if there is inflammation or not. The only parameter that we have is profuse bleeding. If you don't, then you can try it. And that, this is the best answer I, think, I can think of, honestly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samhan. So I have a more serious, serious questions right now. Uh, <laughs> sure, sure. It says, uh, the, yeah, are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Uh, so uh, we have Mishari. Mishari and Mishari, uh, you can unmute and, and ask your question. Mishari? Yes. Further. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samhan, for this is an informative lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, I just uh, would like to ask you about the stepwise technique, the success rate for it. Could you just uh, give us uh, your opinion? Now, when it comes to stepwise excavation, this is a very old technique from the 70s. 
And basically, what happened is that they would remo remove all caries and leave the caries that is close to the pulp, and then they would leave it for a couple of months to allow tertiary dentine to develop, and then they would revis revisit uh, the caries and then try to remove the rest. What we found is that every time when we come back to remove the rest of the caries, it becomes arrested, it becomes harder to probe, and it becomes darker, which means that it has arrested. And then the procedure, you would remove the caries and then uh, do your filling. The problem is that you have two failures. The first failure could be if it comes necrotic. If it, if it doesn't, then there is a high risk of pulp exposure when, when you come back again. That's why partial or indirect pulp cap came, because we know if we seal well, we'll force the lesion to arrest. And why do we have to come back again? So the success rate of indirect pulp cap is not because the procedure itself is beautiful, but because we reduced the chances of uh, pulp exposure in the second visit. So I think, I think from 80%, 70% to 80% success rate of, uh, sorry, going back to the to answer, from 70 to 80% is tibois excavation, uh, according to Biondel, uh, and success rate of tibois excavation, minimal 80s to the 90s, according to Maltz. Okay, Dr. Dusamhan, do you hear me? Sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, if we do another technique, if we just put an MTA and through it by GIC or vitro bond and the permanent restoration at the same time, in this situation, is it, is it worse or? I'll let you know. Uh, when you leave caries? Yes, in a stepwise technique. Now, the idea of stepwise excavation is actually to provide a cheaper, uh, affordable, uh, treatment to general dentist because MTA is expensive. Haram to get on a deep caries. But if you maintain two millimeter, then you really don't need to seal because there is already caries, right? Yes. And the pulp was able to protect itself by uh, dentinal sclerosis, by tertiary dentine, by whatever, right? Now, if the pulp was able to protect itself all this time from this caries, why do you want to seal? Already sealed, right? Yeah, so the idea. If you wanted to use MTA, to what? To just to, to, to make it one visit only, to minimize the visits for the clinic. Actually, you can do it in one visit. You just need to place a glass A number and uh, you don't have to come back in the second visit. Actually, it is not recommended to do uh, partial uh, stepwise excavation. I think partial caries removal is superior, so you should consider that. And one okay, visit. Thank you, Doctor Doctor Thank you for answering, and thank you for uh, uh, Doctor Mushari. Uh, um, next, uh, Doctor Abdullah Abdullah Yaqub. Father. السلام عليكم دكتور سمحان نشكرك على الشرف لك الله خير دكتور have just one question regarding the materials of pulp capping uh, last time I was I'm a GP I was assisting an endodontist and we did partial pulpotomy and he advised me to put fresh mix of calcium hydroxide and he refused to put MTA or biodentine uh, claiming that MTA or biodentine if the treatment failed we will have classification of the root canals and we will not be able to negotiate them at the end. So it's better to put fresh mix hydro, uh, calcium hydroxide. So what do you think about this technique and the material? And the other question is, what do you think about the Farical, the new product in the market right now? Um, so he used calcium hydroxide on top of caries, right? No, uh, partial pulpotomy. He removed the two ah, mm of the pulp. Partial. Yes. Yes, yes. partial pulpotomy. Yes. And he did that because he think yes. that MTA. there will be calcification, right? Yes. If, if you yes. place MTA. 
exactly well well uh, i think uh, calcium uh, mta uh, now the main difference between using calcium hydroxide and mta when you use calcium hydroxide when direct contact with the pulp you would have two layers liquefaction necrosis and mm -hmm. coagulation necrosis the liquefaction necrosis is going to disappear راح تذوب راح يصير في space the other problem with using calcium hydroxide as a pulp cap is because you're going to leave holes inside the dentin so you might see it in the x-ray wow I got a dentinal bridge and you will be happy but if you examine this dentinal bridge under a microscope there is a lot of holes inside it this was done by Goldberg, Goldberg in 1984, he found that there are holes on, underneath the um, uh, calcium hydroxide. Unlike MTA and what I showed you a couple of slides, when you see complete dentine bridge, there are no holes underneath the MTA, and that is the, the, the difference. Because underneath MTA, you don't have liquefaction across this layer, you only have a co very thin coagulation uh, layer. Another thing about calcium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide is a fragile material. It's not a sealing material. Unlike MTA, which is a sealing material, at the same time, it's biocompatible. So I don't see any reason uh, or, or justification to use calcium hydroxide unless you don't have MTA. This is the uh, this is what I know. If you don't have MTA, maybe you should use calcium hydroxide and then try to seal it as much as possible. But if you have MTA and you put calcium hydroxide superior to MTA, I don't think I don't think this is a good idea. Uh, did I answer the question? Will uh, Doctor? Yeah, I think. I think it was good. Uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed Jamal uh, will ask a question. Hello, Dr. Dr. Aziz Lonik. Hello, Allah. Hiyakallah. What are you doing? Allah is telling me. Alhamdulillah. I'm going to go. 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 Excellent presentation. Actually, I don't have a question. I just want to say it is excellent presentation. And I just want to emphasize of what uh, Dr. Sasamhan uh, said, and maybe uh, something we can learn from the BD group. They are uh, very active at here in the technique, it's my whole technique in which they don't, uh, they don't remove uh, EDK and they just place a crown. If I totally agree with my doctor, we are taking off you, no, we're having. Uh, basically, the whole technique, um, this was done, I think, first in Dundee. I was there, actually, the dental school, the whole technique. Uh, basically, if the patient, uh, pediatric patients, uh, uh, baby teeth, and what they do, if the patient doesn't have any symptoms, and there is caries, what they do is that they put calcium hydroxide inside a stainless steel crown and they place it directly on the tooth. What that does, it seals the caries underneath and that's it. Success rate is 98%, which is interesting. But if you have an abscess, if you have any symptoms, it's not going to work. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jamal, for uh, your contribution to uh, today's activity. Um, we have also uh, Muad. Uh, unmute uh, Dr. Muad and you can uh, ask your question. Dr. Muad. Okay. Um, let's uh, get uh, some of the questions, uh, some of the text questions. Um, Rawan says, uh, what could explain the presence of periapical radiolucency in the irreversible pulpitis cases? Is it only because the neurogenic inflammation? Why responsiveness to cold test is difficult after vital pulp therapy? Thank you. 
So what happens is that when you think about the sequence of how bacteria attack the pulp, is that the endotoxins, they travel all the way to the tubules, and then you would have the um, antigen-presenting cells. The antigen-presenting cells is going to collect these toxins, and it's going to travel through the uh, blood, blood supply. As soon as it exits uh, the tooth, then you would have this reaction of the bone. Uh, and there will be some kind of uh, osteoclast to genesis uh, that is going to co cause bone resorption. And that's why you can actually have lesions that are really small with um, vital teeth that had deep caries. Uh, it cannot be seen with 2D, usually cannot be seen with 2D images, usually by CBCT or histology. But that doesn't mean that the pulp cannot go back to its uh, health if you actually limit the amount of toxins that comes to the uh, pulp because you have three mechanisms. You have osteo, uh, you have the uh, odontoclast, uh, odontosclerosis, that's the number one. The dentinal tubules will be uh, really small and it will not allow further uh, uh, toxins to come. Second, you would have tertiary dentine. Third, you would have the immune cells to take care of whatever toxins comes to the pulp. And because of that, the pulp cannot can go back it, to its normal position if you can actually contain the influx of uh, toxins. Second, uh, the second question is that, um, what was it? Hmm, I forgot. Second question can be talking about the cold test. <laughs> yes, uh, we know that in, from different scenarios, when you have methylene uh, calcific metamorphosis, when you have a calcified tooth uh, from trauma, EBT works, but cold doesn't work. We know that in older patients, uh, EBT works, uh, cold doesn't work. And the, the fact is that because there is a lot of uh, calcification, uh, the same exactly with when you do full pulpotomy because you put the pulp away from the uh, root uh, tooth surface and that's why it's not going to be conducting cold uh, efficiently compared to EBT. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Samhan. Um, our next question is uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed uh, Yaghmour, what could be the cutoff point of follow-up to consider a material highly reliable and successful in the field of vital pulp therapy? Um, I honestly don't know. If I can get a success of two, three years, four years, this is a, يعني, it means that my uh, material is good to begin with. Uh, failures in the future might be due to marginal leakage or other failures. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the more years we have, the, the better, but uh, we know that dental materials do not last uh, forever. Um, and that's it. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, so, Basil is saying, uh, what are your critical rationale for shifting towards pulpotomy, not full pulpectomy in symptomatic cases. Yeah, this is what I talked about. If you have a kid seven years old, eight years old, you really cannot do root canal treatment efficiently. You have a, a when you have immature tooth, uh, when you have a handicapped patients, when you have a patient that is apprehensive, really scared, you don't think the patient will be able to handle uh, this type of, when you have a, a patient with severe gag reflex, you know that um, it, it would be really hard to place the rubber dam for a very long time. These cases, I think you can uh, start uh, to do uh, pulpotomy when you have a reversible pulpitis. Maybe, maybe, I'm just saying, in the future, we're going to add more to this category, but we don't have enough data to support that yet. Great. Um, Dalal, uh, Dr. Dalal is saying, uh, if I have a case with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, lingering pain, and we could achieve 
hemostasis, can we proceed with pulpotomy? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Uh, there is another case that was uh, by Ricucci, the same guy. He did a video, uh, two premolars, and he placed uh, bioceramic sealer. And he removed in symptomatic reverse pulpitis, and he removed the whole bioceramic sealer after two months or three months, and there is complete dentine, dentine bridge with no symptoms. So we see these cases more coming, but we still don't have enough uh, to really generalize it. Um, um, in the future, inshallah, I think uh, it will be more successful. Okay, um, um, there are general questions, but I, I want to... Uh, you know, go on with the, with the more specific questions towards the topic. And then mm -hmm. if we have time, we can go back to those. So cool. it says, as a conclusion, uh, Tariq al says, uh, as a conclusion, in symptomatic pulp, we should rely more on operational diagnosis and achieving hemostasis. Is that right? I don't know what this exactly. What do you think? Now, okay. Hold on a second, everyone. <laughs> I don't want you... <laughs> This, this presentation is specifically designed for endo residents and for endodontists to increase the awareness of how difficult assessing pulpitis is and to be open-minded in the future for any other studies. It's not, I cannot give guidelines in general. I'm just giving you general guidance okay so we have to be careful because this cannot be really generalized and talked about in the in front of other people because we're going to confuse them was that clear is that clear i think that's pretty clear yeah um you know though this this topic is i know it's very uh, usually uh, among dentists it's very like controversial it reminds me uh i uh, of uh, one of my colleagues who was a prostodontist and he was asking me so you know it's emerging we're in like uh, tough times with with everything that's going on and then he needed the root canal on one of his teeth so he was asking me the prostodontist was asking me uh, so doctor why did my tooth fail i had a pulp capping or i had a like a pulp capping done by an endodontist four years ago and um why did that fail uh today i i think you guys need to like look at your literature for vital pulp therapy or anything i was like all right i know i think there was recurrent decay under your filling <laughs> let's start with that <laughs> and as you mentioned earlier i think it's leakage uh dental materials are not uh they're not permanent it, whatever we do and whatever we give guarantees to the patient usually they are not permanent and they need to be made but it's good. I mean, he, he got his tooth vital for another, for like five years. Exactly. That, that, exactly. That this is what I was going to bad. say. This is what I was going to say. I mean, we postponed uh, his uh, root canal treatment for years. That's not too bad. And if, if you just want to put it on that cycle of, uh, of like tooth survival, like when you have the first filling, then, you know, the, 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 you know, MOD or whatever, like class two, and then endo, and then crown, and then extract. I don't. I think this you did a favor to that the tooth by by uh, maybe delaying that timeline a little bit. Anyway, um, so based on the studies, Dr. Abdihar Abdaziz, based on the studies that achieve successful outcome even with presence of preapical radiolucency, how can I differentiate if the preapical radiolucency was arising from the reversible inflamed pulp or necrotic pulp? It's unlikely, it's unlikely to see it. If you see it, then you would have to do, you would rely on the clinical testing, the cold test, the EBT. I wouldn't solely rely on that. And if it's a kid, I would try to do uh, vital pulp therapy as much as possible, uh, whether it's a partial pulpotomy or full pulpotomy. I wouldn't take that piece of, of information from the radiograph and change my treatment plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hadi is saying, in your opinion, what's the most important step to get a successful vital pulp therapy? That's a <laughs> very tough question. 
Uh, I, I think from slide one to the end. <laughs> um, but I think I think the most important step is actually being aseptic, and that cannot be emphasized. Yeah, I mean you would have to really have to be careful not to introduce any bacteria to the pulp, um, whether it's uh, a dirty pulp, uh, dirty gloves whether if it's a um, um, rubber dam, whether if it's someone touched the ball with their hand with their gloves, all these can actually introduce the to the pulps. I think that is the key. Even if you don't place anything, <laughs> if you just isolate bacteria, you, you would have success. Great. Uh, we have Amal here asking, she says, because we talk about epexogenesis and rich, rich endo in relation to diagnostic terms, Shimzu uh, et al. and Turaben et al., Peng et al., all of these had case reports where uh, symptomatic reversible pulpitis and they did rich endo. So do we consider that as rich endo or epexogenesis according to the... I, I'm not sure about what's there. Uh, uh. I, I don't, I don't really get that question there. So basically, they did. Um, they probably had some confusion, Doctor Samhan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it, no. They were necrotic. They were not. Uh, all of okay. Shimizu from New York and Trobanijad. Uh, we don't do region do for vital pulp, so probably there was some. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So another another general question. I don't know. I, I don't know if you, if we can answer that at this moment. Uh, Dr. Samhan and Dr. Abada mentioned that this is a seminar for um, the uh, postgraduate. It's meant to be for the postgraduate to discuss this issue. It says, how can we conclude that uh, pulpotomy is the first line of treatment in symptomatic irreversible pulpitis? Hopefully, hopefully in the next five years. <laughs> We cannot really throw uh, suggestions without data. And unless we do randomized clinical trials to see exactly if it works or not. We know that now the first, what we do at the beginning, usually case series. And case series are really good to see that it works. Now we need to compare it to other techniques to see if they are as good. Unless we get that to that point, then I wouldn't recommend doing it, generally speaking, unless you do it for a specific cases that I talked about earlier. Okay. Uh, Abdullah, Dr. Abdullah, I'm going to give you the mic uh, because I see you have questions. Uh, uh, a question, you have written a question and you are raising your hand. So I'm giving you the mic, Dr. Abdullah, to ask the question that you had in mind. Tfadda. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, Dr. Samhan, for the work and the work of Allah. Thank you. Just a question, how to differentiate between, between partial necrotic bulb and total necrotic bulb? And what, is, what are the treatment options? I think uh, when you have a positive uh, pulp test to call, then you should assume that it's most likely either an intact pulp or there is a microabscess. That's it. It's not going to be, because as I mentioned earlier, the necrosis goes by increments. And if the coronal uh, part is responding to cold, then you should assume that there is good tissues uh, coronally. This is my assumption. Um, when you don't have a response to cold, then you assume that the necrosis actually went below the CAG. Treatment options are a lot. We talked about them. You either have a, a partial, direct, uh, full pulpotomy, root canal treatments. All of these are uh, treatment options. Thank you, Dr. Samhan, uh, for taking that. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Maat. Dr. Maat, I unmuted your mic. Are you ready to talk? Annie? 
تسمعني؟ تفضل دكتور. تفضل. اهلا دكتور سمحان واهلا بالجميع ورمضان بارك عليكم جميعا. ثانك يو دكتور سمحان فور ذيس نايس برزنتيشن از يوجل ما شاء الله تالنتد نتعلم منك. Uh, بس في ملاحظه بسيطه انا هذا طبعا رايي انا اشوف المحاضره يمتصها الكرنت ليتشر بالموضوع لانه يعني الحين لو hey. تشوف اخر 5 ييرز تقريبا بالليتشر يو كان فايند ا لوت اوف كلينيكال ترايل اون ذيس فيلد اند وي هاف اولسو بروميسنج ريزلت فانا اعتقد يس اعتقد انه هذا اللي كان ينقص المحاضره واتوقع ان هذه ما تخفى عليك لانه فيها اعتقد دكتور قديمات من الكويت وفيها okay. عمل كلينيكال ترايل ريسنتلي دكتوره نسرين طه ايضا من الاردن سعيده السياري وفي ميني ميني ارتكل صراحه they, uh, they show a promising result and they are uh, clinical trial yes not case series طبعا دكتوره انا I, I have interest in this topic and I present uh, a lecture in the last uh, congress in Vienna <clears throat> and also I met uh, Dr. Nasrin Taha at, at the first time. Uh, nice. طيب Dr. Anatabad, you know, يعني, can, uh, I practice vital therapy in my own cases. Uh, based on my يعني, little experience with Moldova, I like to have a partial bulbotomy rather than a direct bulb cabin or full bulbotomy. And it's worked with me. All my cases, uh, I had uh, success, success يعني, on these cases. آه، يمكن هذا الكلام بيطول لو اقدر اتكلم بالتفصيل لكن اعتقد انه البارشا بابوتومي حتى لو كان في فيلير ستيل عندنا خطر رجع يعني مو زي الفول بابوتومي يعني طبعا رايي في الموضوع ايضا دكتور في موضوع اشوف ايضا ما تكلمت عنه اللي هو نيو ماتيريال اللي هي بايودنتين وبايوسيران اي نو انها يعني ممكن انها تكون سيميلر تو ذا ام تي اي لكن موست اوف ذا ريسنت ستدي They used uh, biodentine and pyosan uh, as a material for vital therapy. Uh, but okay, Victor. And so I think even can we advise the general dentist to perform a vital therapy? But I'm a personal doctor. I need to have the topic. But I want to hear your opinion on the topic. And the second question: When do you think that vital therapy will be considered as standard of care? At least for us as endodontists, because we I mean, we perform a septic I mean, uh, procedure and we work under microscope. متى تعتقد دكتور إن الوقت نقدر نعتبر based on طبعاً on the current literature or current evidence ممكن يعني any vital case حتى لو كانت يعني irreversible inflame we يعني we practice vital therapy in this case. وشكرا جزيلاً. مشكور على التعليق الطيب مشكور اخوي معاذ انا ودي لو ترسل لي ايميل عن هالبيبرز اللي ذكرتهم موست اوف طبعا ماي برزنتيشن هذه تقريبا تقريبا 80% مسويها 2012 او 2013 بس اي جست ابديتد ا ليتل بيت بيكوز اي ديد هاف تايم متى يصير ستاندرد اوف كير؟ اي اونستلي دونت نو لو تلاحظ هذه الاوروبيان سوسايتي بوزيشن ستيتمنت يعني ذكروها على حياء اوكي اوكي في ايفيدنس بس ستيل لان في ا لوت اوف بوليتكس بالموضوع و ا لوت اوف اندودونتست ار اجينست ذس بس بوجهه نظري ان الموضوع ما في مجاملات وانس يو هاف ا بروميسنج بروسيجر شود بي دان The idea of partial perpotomy is a great idea. And عشان يكون عندك خط رجعة. But I'm not sure if we do it in a clinical trial and compare it to full perpotomy, which one is going to be more successful? Because it's even more. The perpotomy is way more to get to. Can we advise the general dentist? I don't think so, unless they have some experience. Uh, and they know how to do the, these cases under a microscope and uh, or magnification uh, and rubber dam. We don't want them to do that. We just want them to practice indirect pulp cap. And the problem is that they don't do it. Uh, indirect pulp cap is a very cheap, very affordable, easy to use. And unfortunately, 
يعني عندنا بالكويت يعني كانك ما تكلم تكلم نفسك يو بريزنت ذيم وذ اول ذيس انفورميشن اند ذي ذي دونت نو وات تو دو وذ ات سو اتس ريلي هارد تو تشينج المينتاليتي اوف ذا هول انليس يو هاف جايد لاينز عندك باور ان ذا مينستري اور سمثينج ذيس از سمثينج ذات يو كان دو ايفن دنتال سكولز ماني دنتال سكولز دو نوت تيتش ذات ذات از ايفن ورس سو Um, hopefully, we'll start the I don't know. Sure, for a different answer. Actually, uh, it's always the topic is very important. The topic of the vital therapy and it's very controversial. But and I think always that the best best uh, people who speak in in that subject are the usually the endodontists. Because uh, usually, you know, uh, many endodontists. I'm not sure. All of, I'm not sure. It's they're not all of them, but many endodontists think of uh, dental vocabulary as a threat to their uh, profession. Maybe uh, I'm not sure how to think about it. They think like the the, the speciality is going down. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it should be done. That's why it should be done by endodontists. You still have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, necrotic teeth to deal with. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. تسمح لي دكتور حويت دكتور سمحان. تفضل. بس بتعقيبا على دكتور معاد أنا أنا أعتقد إنه أنا أنا ما أوير في الستاديز حق دكتور طاها نسيرين طاها بالأردن. I think most of them are case serious. Uh, ما في ما في رندمايز كلينيكال ترايل كومبيرد البوتومي مع الروت كانال اذا كان موجود فورورد uh, الايميل لي حتى انا لان انا ام ام فولوينج اول اوف ذيس بيبرز طاها سوت واحده رندمايز كلينيكال ترايلز في اعتقد 2017 او 16 كانت بارشال بوتومي كومبيرينج ام تي اي وكاسمركسايد يعني شي uh, نيفر حتى اصلا كيس سيريز You can find a lot of flaws in the design of the case series that they publish it. But I'm not aware of, of a single study they did full bulbotomy compared the root canal as a randomized clinical trial. But that's why Dr. Taha, if Dr. Muad got some papers to send it to you, uh, please forward it to me as well. Thank you, Dr. Abada. Um, I think uh, many questions I've seen um, in the chat, uh, I, I can't really get to read uh, the chat area, uh, but I think I have maybe let's do two more questions. Is that okay for you, Dr. Samhan? Sure, absolutely. Two more is okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Samhan, it says, Nawaf uh, al-Mutayri says, he's saying, my question is regarding the success rate of polypotomy cases or vital pulp therapy in general. In such deep cases, depend on what. Most of the studies showed very short follow-up and different methods. How do you reflect on that? Uh, we still don't know. Long term, we still don't know. But that's why I, I say that it's a very good alternative. It's a good alternative. Then we'll talk about uh, which one is better. Um, uh, if it gives me 80% or 90%, I'll be more than happy. I think success in young group, especially immature teeth, are much higher, especially when you have an aseptic uh, environment. Okay. Uh, okay, last question. Yes, it's recommended to do you know, okay. Sorry if not two different groups of words, same answer. So, okay, so Ahmed is uh, coming up with the question again. Is he saying that, uh, okay, two different case reports for Trabinajad uh, that used PRP and for Shinzo in 2012? But my question still, with irreversible pulpitis, can we do re- or we can do uh, regenerative endo or not? Hmm. I think she's. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, she's yeah, asking yeah, if. I mean, the the idea that I want them to understand. 
when you have a reversible pulpitis, the inflammation is localized to the site of infection. That's the most important point. And it's usually really small. Next to the slides, the Shiftuha and Rikuchi. If that is the case, then when you remove the coronal part, you should be fine. You would have a healthy pulp. It's up to you to do whatever you want. To be PRP, to be... I don't know, honestly, and regenerative. Um, did they... I don't know what happened, but they used PRP. I don't know. But generally speaking, this is the idea I wanted to uh, deliver. Okay. Thank you. I hope Hanna. I answered the really, question. I, I think I hope so too. <laughs> I'm sorry. Lava, lava. If I'm if I'm if I'm if I'm if I'm please, please let me know. Uh, حق السائل اللي يسأل يدز لي رسالة ويقول لي إذا أنا جاوبت ولا لا later عشان أكون عشان أعرف بالضبط شنو كان السؤال again. Okay. Yeah, I think I think uh, thank you, Doctor, for I mean, the rehab it's all like I think it, uh, that's a good. Uh, if if I see as as ila that was not, I uh, mean, clear or uh, anything. I think I think you should talk to Doctor Samhan directly on his uh, social media. Um, I think that's it. Uh, we're good. Corinne, we're good. 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 We're good